strange situation in the fact that the previous person we had talked to, we had got down to the end, we went, gave the presentation of the gospel, got down to the end, the person said, well, you know, we asked him, he said, do you want to get saved? And they came down, you know, and, and, and their response was, well, I just don't think so at this time. I just, you know, maybe a little bit later I will. And, and then so I, I you know, just kind of said, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, push you in any way, you know, shape, or form, but do you honestly know how long that you have to live? I said, we, we all don't know. I mean, we could be, you know, five, six years old or 85 years old or whatever. Um, and we don't necessarily know how, how long the Lord has for us. And just kind of presented that to them. And they thought about it for a little longer and said, you know, just not at this time. And so that was the previous one. Well, we talked to Nanny. The same situation comes up with her. And she starts saying the same thing. You know, I don't know, probably not at this time, maybe a little bit later. And I just, again, we just began to talk to her about, we don't know how long we have and everything else. And she said, I said, so what do you think? Do you want to get saved? And she says, you know what? Yes. And so she wanted to get saved at that point. So it just goes to show that people come from different, you know, different avenues, different mindsets and everything else. You would think a person that, you know, was right there at the doorstep. I mean, honestly, right there to receive the Lord would. But a lot of times that's what ends up happening is that there's a person that will say, no, I got more time. And they want to sit there and they want to, uh, they want to have that mindset that they have more time. And we don't know that, honestly. It's not a scare tactic. We just don't know. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody, you know, uh, you know, I talked about this a little bit last week and in other times that a person you were just talking to a day ago and all of a sudden they had died today. And then you go, well, I just got done talking to them yesterday. What happened? And so we don't honestly know. And actually a little bit of this is actually, you say, well, Pastor, are you going to get into the sermon? Actually a little bit of this is actually in the sermon uh, this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter 4. As we continue to go through Hebrews, um, uh, we just continue to see more and more that the Apostle Paul, whom I believe wrote, uh, who has written or at least has preached this book, um, because there are a lot of people that believe that this is actually a sermon or sermon notes that maybe Luke the uh, you know the Luke that wrote um, the Gospel of Luke and also the uh, the Book of Acts as well took sermon notes while Paul was preaching and this is Paul's sermon and uh, so when we look at this it actually almost reads like a sermon as well and I wish honestly that I was able to preach this way you know this eloquently that they are uh, that Paul preaches here and so Hebrews chapter four starting at verse one it says let us therefore fear lest a promise being left uh, left us of entering into his rest. Any of you uh, should, should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he, uh, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spank in, uh, in a certain place of the, seventh day, uh, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if, if, they, should, uh, uh, if they shall enter into him, uh, my rest. Verse 6, seeing therefore... It remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to, uh, to whom it was first preached entered not in, uh, in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a, he, he limited a, a, a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then... Would, be, uh, would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest, a rest to the people of God. For he, uh, he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into the, uh, that rest, lest, at any, lest any man uh, fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any 
creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all, uh, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have, have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may uh, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning, that I would uh, preach your word with boldness. And Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear uh, your word, and that we not only just hear your word, but we also do your word. And Lord, I pray that, that this morning, that as, uh, that you, as you, you have, uh, that as you empower me to preach your word, that you would empower uh, your people to go and preach your word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So very likely, somebody sometime, usually around the time of, like say, Black Friday, all those kind of sales, there's usually a very special deal. And usually, you know, there's those times where you say, there's something that I absolutely really need that is on sale at Black Friday. The problem is, is that most of the time, what happens on those things that you really need on Black Friday is that you get up early. My wife gets up early. I sleep. She gets up early, she goes and, and finds them, but there's often a lot of times that those things that people say they absolutely need, which are, you know, they don't need like a new TV. Some people have like five, six TVs, and they're like, I need another one because this one's so cheap on price. But when you go there, what ends up happening? Those ones are not on sale anymore, right? They're gone and everything else. But the thing is, is that when we need something, we go to a store and we find out sometimes that the special is over or we miss it by, the, uh, by time and we miss that deal. And it can be very disappointing, Right? In a much greater way, God is warning, you know, warns us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we must not neglect God's special offer of eternal rest. When, we die, uh, when you die or when Jesus comes back to take the saints, his special offer will be over for all of eternity. Do, uh, and don't let Satan deceive you into thinking that you have, a, you have plenty of time or that you will get a second chance later. That's a lie. This life is your second chance. As long as you have, you have breath in your lungs, you have a chance. But we don't know how long that we actually have. And obviously, if you're saved, you have entered into that rest already. And nobody can take that rest from you. So if you're not saved, you don't have that rest, right? Well, in Hebrews chapter 4, it seems to focus, uh, you know, seems to focus upon believing upon the Lord for salvation. That's how you get saved, right? And not procrastinating like we talked about in Hebrews chapter 3 last week, right? But chapter 4 is different in this fact that Paul has been preaching up to this point about how Jesus is better than the angels, that Jesus is better than the prophets, and he's better than Moses. And he's going to go on and say that he's better than the, the, the sacrificial system, that he's better than the, you know, than the old covenant, that he's better than anything, right? He has already warned us once against going back and doing the things one, uh, that we once did that were of no profit. Your old life doesn't profit you anything. Doing the things that you did in your, uh, in your former life before you were saved profit you nothing. And he's, he's talked about it. He says, don't do that. And Jesus' suffering had a purpose, right? Jesus didn't suffer so you can just go do whatever you want to do. His suffering had a purpose. And it's not for us to procrastinate in sharing the gospel with the unsaved. One of the things that oftentimes happens is, well, I can go outside later, or I can do this later, or I can, go, I can talk to this person later. But I've met many of people that said, I was getting ready to talk to this person about Jesus, and then they passed away. How long do you actually have? How long do you know that you have? And I'm not trying to, you sit here, well, Pastor, you're just trying to coax me into talking to somebody about you. If, if, actually, you know what? If that's the case, yes, I am. Because their eternity is in the balance. Their eternity is in the balance about whether or not you say, uh, you know, you preach the gospel to them and give that offer to them and say, do you want to be saved? They have to get to that point. They have to sit there and say, and the thing is, is that say you go knock on a door and somebody says, and you tell them what you're doing and they say, no, I don't want to hear it. That's their opportunity. And so if you go talk to somebody at, at work 
and you're saying, hey, can I talk to you for a few moments about what Jesus did in my life or, you know, how Jesus can save you? And they say, no, there's their opportunity. You may have another opportunity to share the gospel with them, but you may not. Chapter 4 goes deeper into, uh, into not neglecting God's rest and looking forward to his rest. Paul is appealing to the unbelieving Hebrews, mainly in this chapter. He's talking to those, those ones who are not saved. Like I said, he's preaching a sermon. He's, he's appealing to them, saying, you know what? You need to get saved. The, you know, the Jesus that you have rejected, you need to get saved by him because he's the only one that can save you, and he's better than anything that you're putting your faith in now. But you know what? Besides that, there is much for the, the believer to learn and would do well to learn and to know from this chapter. So don't sit there and think, well, you know what, I'm already saved. I don't have to listen to this. God's word can speak to you in any way, shape, or form. Just because this is mainly focused to the, non, you know, the non-believing person does not, believe, uh, you know, does not mean that you, don't, you can just turn it off and be like, okay, pastor, I'll catch you next week. The apostle here leaves us with four urgent challenges regarding his rest. Each of these each, each are identified by the phrase, let us. So there are actually four let us statements that he has in here. And so what we want to look at in, in verses 1 through 10, it's a big portion of it because some of this we, already, we heard in chapter 3, especially the part where he says, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, right? He's already said that in chapter 3 twice, and now he says it a third time. Why is he doing that? Repetition makes you remember. He's doing it for emphasis to remind you that if God is speaking you to, uh, to you today, do not harden your heart, but listen to him. Don't sit there and say, you know what, I'll do Okay, God, I hear you, but I'll do it next week. Or I'll do it whatever. Do it when he asks you to do it. Oftentimes, any parent can understand this. Any grandparent can understand this. Any aunt and uncle can understand this. Why? Because they have, you know, there's children. There's grandchildren, there's nieces and nephews that when you ask them to do something, well, they'll say, I'll just do it later. And if some, I mean, am I the only one that knows that when a child says, I will do it later, that means I don't plan on doing it later? (laughs) Do you know why? Because I was a child once. And that's what it meant to me when my, you know, if my dad asked me to go take out the trash, what would I do? I'd say, I'll just do, I'll do it later. I'll just do it later. I'll do it later. Or my mom, take out, you know, you know, get the dishes out of the dishwasher, put them away. I'll do it later. If the dishwasher hadn't already washed away all the food and made them clean, by the time I would get to it, if it was ever, there would have been mold growing on them. If that was possible, but all the, you know, obviously the dishwasher you know, washes all that away, hopefully. But here's the thing is, number one is, let us, let us fear coming short of God's rest. It says, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Coming short of his rest means you're not saved. Coming short of it is just like that person at the door that said, I'll just wait until later. It's that same person that will sit there and say, I will procrastinate as long as possible so I don't have to do it. Or I'll wait until I'm in my 20s where I have a family, you know, a wife and kids or whatever, and then I'll go to church. Or then I'll start getting serious about my relationship with the Lord. Or when this happens. Or when this happens. See, this is the, the reason why the Apostle Paul is making this statement is because many in Israel, many Jews, many Hebrews lacked faith. They saw Jesus. They saw him crucified. They were around him. They heard him. All these things happened, and they lacked faith. That's one of the funny things is, is that people will say, well, if, if Jesus was you know, alive today, then many of the Jews would get saved. They didn't do it back then. They don't do it now. You know why? It's because of the fact that they don't want their faith mixed, as it says in here, or uh, uh, mixed with uh, faith. Or sorry, yeah, it says that, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that they heard it. So you can preach the word, but if they don't want to hear it, they're not going to hear it. But pastor, I thought you said that God's word won't return void. Oh, it won't. It'll keep on haunting them over and over again. 
until they decide what they actually really want to do with it. Just like sometimes when God speaks to you through, uh, through his word and you say, you know, you heard it, but you weren't really listening. You ever had those moments? I mean, I was a kid just like anybody else in this room. There's not many times I've heard my parents say something and do something, but did I listen to them? Don't go play in the street. I heard that when I was a kid. I go to my ba- uh, the babysitter's house, and what will I do? Go play in the street. Until a car came and almost hit me one time. Then I was like, that's probably a good thing to listen to your parents, right? Or my grandmother, she told me she lived on a very, very busy road. And you hear, you know, and cars would just go by. There's often a lot of accidents in front of her house where she lived. That was the time where I listened to my grandmother because my grandmother would actually hold my hand because I had to listen at that moment. My grandmother was like, let's go across the street. She said, stop, and you know, just like, pull you back, right? Because there's still a car coming, and she didn't want to, like, I had to explain to my parents how she was taking us across the street to go, uh, to, go to the convenience store, and their child got ran over or got hit by a car. There's so there's, you know, things, and this is what happened is, is with Israel. Israel heard Jesus. They, the Jewish people heard him. He, he preached to them, and yet they still did not get saved. They still didn't get saved. I mean, that's the reason why I believe right now that there are so many Jewish people that end up hating the Lord or are turning their back on God. Why? Because what did they say at, at his trial? Let his blood be upon us and our children's children. That curse is still going today, that there are a lot of ones that do not want to hear it. Yes, there are Jewish people that are getting saved, but there are a lot of them that are not. Why? Because that curse is still, because they're like, you know what, I don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the fact of that Jesus is. But here's the thing is, is that in verse 1 where it says, let us therefore fear, and the fact of us missing, you know, of somebody missing salvation, or the fact of like not listening to God, that should put fear in our heart. If, you know, obviously that should put fear in our heart if we have not truly yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Or the fact that, you know what, if we, we continue not to hear, we end up backsliding and we harden our hearts. That doesn't mean we lost our salvation. It just means the fact is, is that, we did, you know, that we're hard, uh, hard of hearing of God's voice. You say, well, God doesn't seem to speak to me like he used to. The reason why he doesn't speak to you as much through his word is because you're not doing what he has asked you to do. Then you need to be reconciled to the Lord, right? That's where there's supposed to be an amen after that one, I was hoping. But think about this. For those that are unsaved, hell is eternal, right? And it's terrible beyond, uh, beyond comprehension. It, is, it lasts forever. And I'm sorry, actually, the lake of fire lasts forever, ever, you know, because we know that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. That's eternity for the non-believer, is that they are tormented and tortured for all of eternity. They missed, in verse 2, it talks about that they missed God's rest because of their unbelief. If you don't get saved, you never have rest. But when you, when you are saved, you have rest in the Lord. It's not something that we have to sit there and wait for later on, like when we die, but we have rest. I mean, think about it. When you get saved, there's a calmness that comes over you, almost a rest because of the fact is, is that you're no longer in darkness, you're no longer going to hell, but you're on your way to heaven, and you can rest in that because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen? True believers have entered, like in verse 3, have entered God's rest. We have entered that rest. God's rest was not just the promised land of Canaan. He, this, this is why he goes on in verses 7 and 8 and says, you know what, that, you know what, yes, whereas that was the promised land, that's what they were looking for was that promised land back, you know, back then, but that promise is not uh, for today. We're not promised to go back to the land of Canaan. What we're promised is, is that we have a heavenly home. He spoke of another day. That's the day he's speaking. He's speaking of another day is that that, uh, that promised land is now heaven. We have that promise in Christ. Verses 9 and 10, the Bible, uh, Bible says this. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his as God did from his. 
This life is full of stress, right? Full of fatigue. That, but, you know, God has prepared a restful, eternal home in heaven for every, uh, every true believer, right? John chapter 14, verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The Bible says that he has prepared a mansion for those who are saved, Right? God has that, you know, for us. And the thing is, is that, you know, last week we talked about, you know, the the fact of being tired, but you're doing worldly stuff. And the fact that then, you know, uh, contrasting that with doing God's work and being tired, you say, well, pastor, no matter what, I'm being tired. Well, here's the thing is, is that when you're tired and you're doing God's work, oftentimes you wake up rested. It's when you're over here trying to mix the two that you get over here doing, oh, I'm doing a little bit of Jesus, and then go on to this side of the world, and you're doing all those things, and you're like, man, I, can, I can't seem to get any rest. Because you're mixing and mingling those things you know, with the world. And, with, and the thing is, is that obviously we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are to, you know, when we go to work and we go to the grocery store, when we go to these different places, we are still in this you know, world, but we're not of this world. My, my home is not here. You go, yes, you do. I know your address. I know where you live. No, that's where I live right, you know, live right now, but that's not for eternity. That's temporary. My eternity is secure in Jesus Christ. And he has prepared a place for me, and he has prepared a place for, for, for us that are true Bible-believing Christians, that you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that you are saved, that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why I find it funny that there's a whole bunch of people out there that will say, well, you got to repent of all your sins. There's nobody that has repented of every single sin in their life. Should you repent of your sins? Should you turn from sin? Yes, but there's no way possible that you will ever repent of every single sin. You know why? Because the thought of foolishness is sin. How many stupid, okay, how many stupid thoughts have I had? I don't even want to start counting. Do you know the reason why, you know, some people go, well, Pastor, that's not really a hopeful message. But you know what? When you're saved, there is the grace of God that covers my sin. God rested or ceased from his work on the day of the seventh day, on the, on, sorry, from his work of creation on the seventh day. Those who enter God's heavenly rest cease from their work in heaven where we will forever full, uh, feel fully rested, right? So in other words, you say, well, pastor, you know, there's times where I still am doing God's work and I'm still tired. You get to heaven, you know, when we get there, you're, you're going to finally feel fully rested. Do you know why? Because you have a body that, you know, is incorruptible. You, have, you received your glorified body, and you, you then at that point won't need to rest, You'll have your rest in Christ because you're with him for all of eternity. And I sit there and say amen because I get tired you know, sometimes you know, pretty quickly. And I've heard this statement over and over again because it's the fact of like, you know, as we get older, right? But in this life, we will get tired. Why? Because this, this body is going to let us down. For, for the young people that are in here, you'll sit there and say, well, you're talking about I have all, the, all, I have all the energy in the world. I feel great. Just wait. If the Lord should, should allow you, to, you know, to, to see 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, you'll find out that your body will let you down too. And if, you know, by the time you, know, you, you sit there and you say, you know what, I'm a, I, have, you know, I have a body of like a Greek god. Well, I don't know why you would have that. But the thing is, like, I go out there, I work out and everything else. You will get tired. That body will let you down. And one of the things is, is that ever, uh, ever since I have, I was sick, and then now I'm trying to get myself back to being healthy, and I've been getting, you know, to work out, there are days I go, you know what? Today is a good day to take a rest. I'll go do other things, but I'm not going to work out, you know, as much as I used to, all right? So number one was, let us, let us fear coming short of God's rest. Don't just, uh, don't just do things just because somebody asks you to do it. Realize and know that God has something for you that day. 
Number two is, let us labor to enter God's rest. And you'll say, well, wait a second, Pastor. I thought you said we don't have to do works in order to get into heaven. We don't. What it means is that if you're not saved, do not fall short because of unbelief. Basically, don't just get to that door, you know, all, you know, have somebody come to your door, preach the gospel to you, and then you say, no, I'll just do it later. Don't do that. That's what, he's, that's what he is telling us here. You know, the word, la- uh, you know, the word labor re- literally translated means to hasten or make haste, to exert oneself, to endeavor or give, uh, give attention to, to give diligence to. Labor or works is not how you attain salvation because, you know what, we, uh, if you're saved, you're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved because of your works. And if you have not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you must hasten and give diligence to this. It is extremely important. To delay is fatal. If we sit there and we, it, if a person is not saved and they, and they delay on it, that could be fatal to them. If they keep putting it off, say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll just do it tomorrow. I'll just do it a little bit later. I'll just do it next week. I'll do it, you know. That is, that is a, uh, a recipe for disaster, literally. Every one of us in this place will stand before God on the day of judgment and give an account to him. Here's the thing. He'll, say, he'll basically come up and say, what have we done with my son? This is why in Matthew chapter 7, where it says, well, Lord, did we not do many amazing works and many marvelous works and do all these things for you? And he says, depart from me, for I, what? Never knew you. It's because that's what the person who has you know, believed the false gospel of repenting of all their sins in order to get into heaven or to, uh, you know, I have to go to church to keep my salvation or I have to do this or I have to get water baptized or I have to, do, I have to pay my tithe every week, at the, you know, in order to stay saved. That's what they're doing, is that they're going right before the Lord and saying, you know what, I did all these things for you. And what does Jesus say? I never knew you. Not that, not that I knew you at one time, and then all of a sudden you turned your back on me. He says, I never knew you. Why? Because you're not saved by your works. You're saved by grace through faith. That's why he says, I never knew you. And for sadly... We have talked to many of people, and, and they'll come over there over and over again. And there was somebody you know, a few weeks ago that we sat there, and we talked to this, you know, this one guy. He, goes to a, he went to another church, and we just began to ask him, you know, say, what, do you, what do you have to do to be saved? And he started talking about how he needed to repent of all of his sins, that he had to you know, be water baptized, and that he had to do this, this, and all these things in order to be saved. And it seemed like we were making headway with him. We began to, talk, you know, you know, began to show him what the Bible says about it. And meanwhile, this person, as, as we're you know, discussing with him, his uncle is there. And then later on, his dad shows up. And about halfway through the conversation, it flips to where he's no longer listening to the gospel. He says, no, you must repent of all your sins. After showed him verse after verse after verse in the Bible where it says that, you know, that we don't need to repent of our sins, that we just believe on the Lord. He all of a sudden is just like, nope, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. You're putting your own twist upon it. He says that I was just uh, uh, you know, doing the scripture. And here's the funny thing is, is that the silent partner that was with me said the same thing. He's like, he's just reading from the Bible. The even funnier part is, is that uncle and dad, who are now listening, are going, he hasn't twisted anything. He's just read to you what the Bible says. And they kept on saying that over and over again. He's like, he's not twisting it. Why do you keep on saying that he's twisting it and that he's making to say it, what he wants to say? And I just said, sir, I'm reading the, you know, the verse to you. That's all I am doing. And over and over again, he said, no, that's not it. That's because you, know, you have some cult churches out there that will sit there and ingrain this and indoctrinate people to where they, you know, for them, if they turn their back on that, all of a sudden, that not only means that they're turning their back on that church, but it means they're turning their back on their family, their friends, and all these things, and they don't want to lose that. That's why Jesus says, what is a profit of man if he gained the whole world but yet loses his own soul? It's a sad situation to see those things. But when we stand before God on the day of judgment 
and give an account to him. If you lack faith or you don't have the faith in Christ's atonement for your sins, you will fall uh, before the Lord guilty and with no hope. And there's no cunning lawyer, there's no crafty lawyer that is going to find a loophole and help you escape. Do you know what the loophole is, if you want to know what the loophole in the Bible is? Keeping every single one of the commandments. And that's not a loophole because we know what? The Bible says that if we offend at one point, that we're guilty of them all. And no one can keep every single one of them. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Because he's our perfect sacrifice, right? And so... The loophole they're going to try and find is going to actually shoot themselves, you know, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. And there's no way, there's no, uh, no way anybody can escape this. And also, I would contend that we should also, for the, you know, for the believer, that we should study or labor to show thyself approved unto God by reading his word, right? We should study his word. For many of us, or for a lot of us, what we need to do is move from, or, you know, move from the baby bottle to the filet mignon of God's word. Somebody's like, what's a filet mignon? Talk to your neighbor. It's delicious, though, I'll tell you that. And that's where we need to move from, is from that baby bottle of God's word to the filet mignon of God's word. We need you know, to, to get over to where we're just, man, God, you know, it's just... God begin, you know, begins to show us some of the deep things you know, you know, in his word you know, that he has. Because there's sometimes people are like, I don't understand this because you're not at that level yet. Like you're not there yet. And people say, well, I need to learn Greek and Hebrew. No, you don't need to learn Greek and Hebrew. You need to read God's word. God has translated his word so we can understand it. Look at verse uh, 12, and, uh, 12 and 13. For the, word, uh, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the, heart, of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest. In other words, manifest being you know, open or laid bare before you know, the sight. It says, in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. When we look at this, what does God's word do? It cuts. That's what God's word do. It's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, right? It cuts us. Why? Because God is letting you know you can't fool him. That it goes all the way down to the very fiber of your being. No matter how much you try to hide, no matter how much you try to keep from God, God knows. Whether you're saved or not saved, and you say, well, if I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. But God wants you doing what he would have you to do through his word. But oftentimes people are like, I'm going to go do my own thing. That's why there's a huge movement, not only in the assemblies of God, but in churches as a whole, that say, you know what, I can drink alcohol, it's okay. And they will say, it's just, I don't, if I just drink a little bit, it's good for my stomach. And they begin to, like, justify what they're doing. And there's a lot of people in the AG that are, are you know, the Assemblies of God that are pushing for the legalization among Christians to drink. What does drinking do? He said, oh, it's fun. Okay. It's awesome. Everybody does it. I mean, hit 21. It's just a party. What it does is it lowers your inhibitions to where you would do stuff and say stuff and act in a way that you would never do sober. That you would sit there and you would begin, I mean, how many fights have started because you got two drunks? Or at least one person is drunk. Because all of a sudden they feel like they're like, I mean, they may be like my size, but they, they feel like they're all of a sudden like they're Shaquille O'Neal. And they're going to get, you know, and they're going to get like just, the floor wiped with them. Or the fact that, you know, all of a sudden people have big talk when they're, when they're drunk, don't they? Or they begin to say stuff and do stuff. Or they begin, you know, they'll say stuff to their spouse that they don't ever mean to say. Like, I didn't mean that. But that's what alcohol does. And that's just, I mean, I just picked that one, you know, out of, out of thin air. There's other stuff, there's other sins out there. And you say, you, know, you, you, you say well, why? Well, think about gluttony. Say, well, watch it, Pastor. We got lunch after this. 
Think about that. Food makes you feel good, right? Makes you feel cozy. Makes you feel all nice or whatever. You know, you, you just get all, you, know, you get filled up and you're going, man, I just feel like I can't move for another five minutes. And then you go get some more. And the thing is, is that by the, by the time you get older, and you may be young, when I say older, it could be five years, all of a sudden you have all these health issues because of those things. And then you sit there and you struggle to try and get that weight off because you know that it's only hindering you. Now, am I sitting there and pointing fingers at anybody else? No, I'm not. I'm saying we all struggle with different things. Some of us struggle with our mouths. Right? Some of us you know, struggle with our thoughts. I already admitted to you that the thought of foolishness is sin, and I just said, how many foolish thoughts have I had? I don't need any help. <laughs> but you can't fool God. God knows you better than you know yourself. You cannot hide your sinful character from God. And I believe that the word of God that it is speaking of, not only is speaking, it's speaking of two, it's speaking of both Jesus Christ, God's living word, and the Bible, God's written word. Note, note the qualities here. That he is quick or he is living. Like he's alive. He's powerful. He's sharper than any two-edged sword. I mean, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15 says this, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Wait, is that a New Testament verse that talks about God's wrath? Because I've heard so many people make, and this is just, a, you know, I'm just going to bring this up. People make this stupid argument that God is somehow different in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament, like he's bipolar. God, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Apostle Paul will make that known in chapter 13. He hasn't changed. The wrath of God that's in the Old Testament, he still has. Read the book of Revelation, and you'll see how much wrath God still has. And actually, Revelation is probably one of the bloodiest, scariest books of the entire Bible. His word pierces the soul and the spirit to the joints and the marrow. That means it identifies, it identifies your sin, your sin, and it convicts you of that sin. That's what God's word is supposed to do. He sees you clearly, and you, uh, you can hide nothing from God. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24 says, God, uh, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Psalm chapter 44, verse 21 says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 through 12 says, Whither, uh, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither uh, shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I may, uh, take the wings of, uh, of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, sure, uh, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You can't hide from God. No matter where you go, there's this false teaching, as I talked about you know, a few weeks ago, that says that when, you, when you, a person dies and goes to hell, that that's eternal separation from God. That's not true. God, you're, not, you're never separated from the Lord. Because it says even here in Psalm, in Psalm 139, it says that if, you, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. You can't escape God. If the fact of somebody saying that I'm eternally separated from God by going to hell, that would actually be a blessing to them. Because then they wouldn't have to deal with God's wrath. Hell is God's wrath to the, uh, wrath to the unbeliever. And God is there. God is there. When you stand before God, he will know all that you have ever done. He has all the facts. Above all, he, know, he will know if you have placed your faith in him for salvation. That is the most important. Have you, have you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ or are you just playing? 
There are people that will come in here week in, week out, act like Christians, act like and do everything else, you know, nice. I have no idea whether or not they're saved or not. I mean, they act like they're saved. And there's ones that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved. I can just, you know, you can just tell. But I'm like, hey, they've been going there for a long time. I mean, they've been here since they were kids. I mean, they ought to be saved by now. I mean, I would hope so. They keep coming here every week after, you know, 20, 30 years. But there are some people that will sit there, you know, in a church pew just because that's what they've always done and never get saved. And how easy Jesus Christ makes it for us to get saved. We need to hasten to enter, uh, enter into God's rest now if you're a non-believer. Don't delay. Without faith in him, you will miss heaven and go to hell. You say, so far, Pastor, you've been talking to the non-believer. I told you a lot of this is for the non-believer. But you have your rest in Jesus Christ. You say, well, Pastor, there's times where I sit there and I feel like I don't have rest in the Lord. Then who moved? You're, if you're staying in God's word, you're studying God's word, you're, you're wanting God to, you know, to, uh, to, to use you in your life, you're saying, you know, I'm going out and, out and, I'm, and I'm, I'm telling people about Jesus, I'm doing what the word of God tells me to do, then you will have that rest. When we do what God asks us to do, we will have his rest. It's when we decide to say, God, you know what, I got this. God, you know what, it's that seventh day, you can take a rest now. That's where we get ourselves messed up. Is that when we say, I got this, you don't got it. So number one is this, let us fear coming short of God's rest. Number two, uh, let us labor to enter God's rest. Number three is, let us hold fast our profession. Let us hold fast our profession. Verses 14 and 15, seeing then that we have a, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which, which cannot be touched with uh, the feeling of our infirmities, but, with, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ is our high priest, so hold on. So hold on. When we hold on to Jesus Christ, when we say, you know what, he is our high priest, think about the Old Testament, that person was the one that would go into the Holy of Holies and uh, make atonement for sins. But that was all just a foreshadowing. That sacrifice meant nothing if the person didn't believe it. Didn't believe in the Lord that the Lord could forgive sin. But that Jesus is our high priest. He has entered in once and for all. There is no more atonement for sins. Once you, once you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing that can change that. That once you're saved, you're always saved. That no matter what, remember the Old Testament like I said, the Old, the Old Testament high priest was the bridge between man and God. Now Jesus is the ultimate bridge between God and us. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is not a one God, there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's a great verse to use, for, uh, use on Catholics, by the way. They won't answer it, I'll tell you that right now, but it's a great verse to use. You say, well, why is that? Because they don't go to Jesus Christ specifically. They go to the priest to have him tell you how many Hail Marys, how many Lord's Prayers, how many other weird prayers that they have out there. You say, well, the Lord's Prayer is in the Bible. It is in the Bible. I'm referring to all the other weird stuff that they have. But by rehearsing the Lord's Prayer and saying that over and over again, that doesn't do anything unless, I mean, that doesn't do anything at all. You say, well, that's scripture. Well, it's good you're being edified in scripture, but it's not doing anything to forgive you of your sins. Because many people will just say that. Many Catholics will say it and don't believe it. They're just doing it because the priest told them that that's how you forgive your sins. Or they, or they believe the Pope. Do you know that the, the Pope itself, and this is not in my notes, you're just getting a freebie. I'm going to just insert this one in here for you. They believe the Pope is Jesus Christ on earth. That's who they believe. So if the Pope says it, they believe it. That's it. But I remember, I remember using this verse. I went to, up to a couple of nuns at a county fair in Illinois. And I, I just, this was when I was newly saved, and, and uh, I'm just as honorary back, you know, I was just as honorary back then as I am now. And I just told them, I said, the Bible says, for there is one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I said, doesn't say the priest, doesn't say the popes. I said, how do you answer that? 
Simple answer that they gave, get out of here. They wouldn't answer it because they know that that one verse basically just blows up their entire religion. Among the fact of like not having any graven images or not to worship any graven images, which their entire church has inside, it's called, oh, they don't call them, they call them saints. They, call them, they don't call them idols. They call them, oh, what do they call them? Images or I can't remember what they, but they, and you know, they conveniently remove that from the Bible. The no graven images from the Ten Commandments. If you ever look at the Ten Commandments in the Catholic Bible, that verse is removed. Why? Because then their, their church ceases to exist. But I digress. Let's go back you know, to where I'm supposed to be. Jesus Christ, obviously, he came to earth. He, clothed, he was clothed in flesh. He died for our sins, and he rose again to complete our salvation. He is the author and finisher of our salvation. He has now passed into the heavens. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He longs to be your bridge to heaven, but you must place your faith in him. The apostle urges us to hold fast our profession. The words translated hold fast literally mean to take hold of. It is not enough to know about Jesus, nor is it enough to call yourself a Christian. I've heard this old, you know, this old saying where you know, just because you stand in the, you know, in the middle of your driveway does not make you, uh, make you a car. <laughs> but if you want you know, a more, an easier, because you're going, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense at all. Let's go with this one. If you're thirsty and I offered you a glass of water, you may know that the refreshing quality of the water, right? But you would not experience it until you took a hold of it and drank it. I mean, how many times has a person sat there and you say, you know what, I have the living water, you're thirsting, I can give it to you, and they're like, oh, that looks pretty. And they just sit there and they don't, they don't do anything with it. The same, you know, this, the same is true of Jesus' promised rest in heaven. Knowing about it will do you no good until you take hold of it by faith. Sin, uh, sinless Jesus understands our weaknesses. Perhaps some of, uh, some of those first century readers were not convinced that Jesus was uh, truly God's high priest who could totally forgive their sin and give them rest. Or perhaps, maybe, maybe like you, you ask this question, but he's God. He can't understand what I've gone through. He can't understand, you know, he doesn't understand what I'm going through right now. Does he? Yes, he does. The apostle reassures us, you know, in verse fifteen, that Jesus is not uh, is not a high priest that not, uh, that cannot truly understand our feelings of infir- uh, of infirmity, our inadequacies. In other words, he truly, yes, he truly understands you. That's why the Bible says, "Cast all your cares upon him." Why? Because he what cares for you. I mean, how can uh, he, can, he can know the temptations that we have faced. And how is that possible? Because what does this say? He was tempted in all points as we are, yet was without sin. So in other words, all those temptations that we go through and have gone through and will go through, he has gone through those, but he didn't sin. He didn't give in to the temptation. He, uh, he faced the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. While he walked on this earth, the devil used his most powerful influences to get Jesus to sin, yet he never sinned. I mean, think about it when, he's in the, uh, when Jesus is in the wilderness. He tempts him with everything that we would go, yeah, I'll do that. I'll give up my divinity. To do, yeah. You say, well, no, I wouldn't. You're telling me that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't even cross your mind just a little bit. If Jesus said, you know, I'll give you everything in this world, you'll never have a problem with any of your bills ever again. You can have whatever you want in this world. You can, you know, you'll be the richest person. You'll never have to worry about a thing again if you just give me your salvation. Sadly, some of us, if we could, would. Satan isn't tempting Jesus with things, you know, that wouldn't be you know, of some sort of benefit or seem like, hey, this is a good deal. Jesus not only knows all the sins that you have done, 
But he also understands every temptation that you have faced. He bled and died and rose again for every one of your sins. He urges you to place your, your faith in him now as Savior rather than standing before him later as your judge. Here's the thing. How many of your sins has Jesus Christ forgiven? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ, you said, he said, well, yes, he's, given, he's forgiven my past sins. I know that. He's given, forgiven my present sins because I've already you know, asked Jesus to forgive. But has he forgiven your future sins? Because you just said that he forgave all of your sins, right? Do you really mean that he forgave all of your sins? You're like, uh, I don't know, Pastor. You're kind of opposing it in a way. Maybe I haven't been forgiven all of my... No, you have. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, And you being dead in your sins, and now realize that being dead in your sins, that's what, what past tense? It says, In the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, hath, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He has forgiven your past, your present, and your future sins. And you say, well, no, that can't be possible. How can he forgive my future sins? I haven't even done them yet. Well, for one thing, it's amazing that he did. But here's how. I mean, think about it. His death and resurrection was 2,000 years ago when he died upon the cross. He was already forgiving the future sins when he died on the cross. Because aren't we in the future from 2,000 years ago? Some of you are going, man, I never thought about it like that. But that's what he does. That he not only forgave your past, amen, he not only gave you your present, but he forgave your future. Whatever stuff that you've done that you haven't even done yet, he's forgiven. Amen? I mean, that's, it is mind-blowing. Doesn't that make you, like, smile at least? Some of you are like, no. Had a bad morning, I don't want to smile. Smile anyways. He's forgiven you of all of your sins, of all of your trespasses. His death and resurrection 2,000 years literally shows us that he can forgive us today and tomorrow, Lord willing. Do not just claim to be a Christian. Take hold of that profession in reality by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, let us fear coming short of God's rest. Let it, number two, let us labor to enter God's rest. Let us hold fast our profession. And number four, let us boldly obtain mercy and grace. Seek his forgiveness with confidence. That when you ask him to forgive you, that you're confident that he will and that he has. God's invitation for us to come boldly to, enter, uh, to his throne of grace means that we can come to his throne with a fearless confidence and with a cheerful courage. The word, therefore, explains how this is possible by pointing us back to the previous verses. As our divine high priest, Christ understands our temptations, and he offered the ultimate sacrifice of himself for our sins. In other words, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Now think about this. While in the context that this verse offers unbelievers confident access to God's saving forgiveness, it has a, second, a secondary application to believers. When we sin, because we will sin, why? Because we're sinners saved by grace. We receive a new spirit at salvation, right? We are born again in our spirit, but our bodies are corruptible and falling apart. When we sin, we also can come boldly to God for forgiveness. When we sin, we can come boldly. You say, well, how is that? I'm such a sinner. I messed up again. No, you can boldly come before his throne of grace. We are assured of this. Why? Because in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? Part of our unrighteousness? Some of our unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. He forgives us all unrighteousness. Christ offers you mercy and grace. You can attain or receive God's mercy, whether you're saved or you're not saved. 
How would it be if you for a not saved person? Salvation is your, you, you attaining your mercy from the Lord and the, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're saved, it's the fact that, you know what, I can come to him boldly and say, you know what, I'm sorry, forgive me. God's mercy is goodness in providing salvation to men by Christ's atonement. If you trust him, he will be merciful. He, God is also merciful to Christians who confess their sins. You can also attain, or you can also receive God's grace for help in time of need. There are those times in your life where you'll sit there and you come to the end of your rope and like, God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've done so much. I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what I can do. God, I just, I just don't know anymore. And you're at your wit's end. You can come to the throne of grace boldly in your time of need. Don't give up just because your situation has gotten bigger. This obviously is referring to a seasonable help, but help just right for every season or situation. God will help you no matter what situation you're in. No matter how many times you mess it up, he's right there. This is especially obviously applies to believers as we frequently need God's grace or divine help during the temptations or in trials of life. So number one was what? Let us fear coming short of God's rest. Number two, let us labor to enter God's rest. Number three, let us uh, hold fast our profession. Number four, let us boldly attain, obtain mercy and grace. Here's the deal. God's offer of salvation is for a limited time only. You say, well, what do you No, God's offer is always there. It's only for a limited time, as long as you live. That's how long that it's available. If you have breath in your lungs, it is, av- uh, it is available for you as long as you live. Death or rapture could end this offer. Oh, actually, it will end this offer. Not could, it would. So I want to ask you these questions. And I close with this. Are you positive that you have placed your faith in him and received his offer of eternal rest? If you haven't, you say, I'm not sure, make sure today. For the believer, if you need God's forgiveness, just know that he is understanding, he's merciful, and he's full of grace. Go with confidence to his throne and receive mercy and grace. If that, if that hits any of you, you say, you know what, I need, you know, I'm saved, but I need God's forgiveness. I need his understanding. I need his mercy. I need his grace. Come boldly to his throne of grace. If you're not saved, you're not sure you're saved, you're like, I'm not really sure, come forward to his throne of grace and receive mercy. So for the next few moments, if that's you, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says this, and you being dead in your sins, and now realize that being dead in your sins, that's what, what past tense? It says, in the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, hath qu- uh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He has forgiven your past, your present, and your future sins. And you say, well, no, that can't be possible. How can he forgive my future sins? I haven't even done them yet. Well, for one thing, that, it's amazing that he did. But here's how. I mean, think about it. His death and resurrection was 2,000 years ago when he died upon the cross. He was already forgiving the future sins when he died on the cross. Because aren't we in the future from 2,000 years ago? Some of you are going, man, I never thought about it like that. But that's what he does. That he not only forgave your past, amen, he not only gave you your present, but he forgave your future. Whatever stuff that you've done that you haven't even done yet, he's forgiven. Amen? I mean, that's, it is mind-blowing. Doesn't that make you, like, smile at least? Some of you are like, no. I a bad morning, I don't want to smile. Smile anyways. He's forgiven you of all of your sins, of all of your trespasses. His death and resurrection 2,000 years literally shows us that he can forgive us today. 
and tomorrow, Lord willing. Do not just claim to be a Christian. Take hold of that profession in reality by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, let us fear coming short of God's rest. Let it, number two, let us labor to enter God's rest. Let us hold fast our profession. And number four, let us boldly obtain mercy and grace. Seek his forgiveness with confidence. That when you ask him to forgive you, that you're confident that he will and that he has. God's invitation for us to come boldly to, enter, uh, to his throne of grace means that we can come to his throne with a fearless confidence and with a cheerful courage. The word, therefore, explains how this is possible by pointing us back to the previous verses. As our divine high priest, Christ understands our temptations, and he offered the ultimate sacrifice of himself for our sins. In other words, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Now think about this. While in the context that this verse offers unbelievers confident access to God's saving forgiveness, it has a, second, a secondary application to believers. When we sin, because we will sin, why? Because we're sinners saved by grace. We receive a new spirit at salvation, right? We are born again in our spirit, but our bodies are corruptible and falling apart. When we sin, we also can come boldly to God for forgiveness. When we sin, we can come boldly. You say, well, how is that? I'm such a sinner. I messed up again. No, you can boldly come before his throne of grace. We are assured of this. Why? Because in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? Part of our unrighteousness? Some of our unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. He forgives us all unrighteousness. Christ offers you mercy and grace. You can attain or receive God's mercy, whether you're saved or you're not saved. How would it be if you're for a not saved person? Salvation is your, you, you attaining your mercy from the Lord and the, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're saved, it's the fact that, you know what, I can come to him boldly and say, you know what, I'm sorry, forgive me. God's mercy is goodness in providing salvation to men by Christ's atonement. If you trust him, he will be merciful. He, God is also merciful to Christians who confess their sins. You can, also attain, or you can also receive God's grace for help in time of need. There are those times in your life where you'll sit there and you come to the end of your robe and like, God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've done so much. I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my robe. I don't know what I can do. God, I just just don't know anymore. And you're at your wit's end. You can come to the throne of grace boldly in your time of need. Don't give up just because your situation has gotten bigger. This obviously is referring to a seasonable help, but help just right for every season or situation. God will help you no matter what situation you're in. No matter how many times you mess it up, he's right there. This is especially obviously applies to believers as we frequently need God's grace or divine help during the temptations or in trials of life. So number one was what? Let us fear coming short of God's rest. Number two, let us labor to enter God's rest. Number three, let us uh, hold fast our profession. Number four, let us boldly attain, obtain mercy and grace. Here's the deal. God's offer of salvation is for a limited time only. You say, well, what do you No, God's offer is always there. It's only for a limited time, as long as you live. That's how long that it's available. If you have breath in your lungs, it is, a, uh, it is available for you as long as you live. Death or rapture could end this offer. Oh, actually, it will end this offer. Not could, it would. 
So I want to ask you these questions. And I close with this. Are you positive that you have placed your faith in him and received his offer of eternal rest? If you haven't, you say, I'm not sure, make sure today. For the believer, if you need God's forgiveness, just know that he is understanding, he's merciful, and he's full of grace. Go with confidence to his throne and receive mercy and grace. If that, if that hits any of you, you say, you know what, I need, you know, I'm saved, but I need God's forgiveness. I need his understanding. I need his mercy. I need his grace. Come boldly to his throne of grace.